Welcome back. You're watching the Jacksonville History Show. Our guest is Dr. Wayne Wood. Wayne, we're going to talk about uh, when modern architecture becomes historic. Uh, things that we didn't think were historic all of a sudden uh, are. Well, this came to the fore not too many years ago when the old Hayden, Lab Hayden Burns Library was threatened with demolition, mm -hmm. and there was a, quite a movement afoot to try to save that building. And people said, well, why would we save that building? It's not that old. Many people didn't think it was that pretty. And it got a lot of people thinking about these buildings that were built in the 50s and 60s that were designed by brilliant architects that are very much part of Jacksonville's architectural fabric that are now becoming eligible for the National Register. The and definition of, of that is when a building is 50 years old, it's eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. And those architects and their buildings are still with us. Many of them are going fast, though, and they're endangered, mm -hmm. not just in Jacksonville, but throughout the world. There is a very strong movement afoot among architectural historians to save these buildings that are collectively called mid-century modern buildings mm -hmm. uh, that were uh, throughout the world, not just in Jacksonville, and many of which are very much threatened and many have been destroyed. So there's now this uh, wave of trying to save these buildings to preserve the architecture from this very important time. Mm -hmm. And if we'll go to our slideshow, sure. we'll look at some of these buildings. <coughs> this all goes back to the Eisenhower era uh, when things were kind of quiet and cool and most people think not much was going on. But in Jacksonville, the first emblem of this movement was the construction of the Prudential Building, the first uh, tall skyscraper on the South Bank and one of the first mid-century modern buildings constructed in Jacksonville that had these nice clean lines that used the technology that emerged after World War II to build uh, taller buildings using concrete in very creative ways. You see buildings with uh, very curvilinear looks to them with uh, folded plate concrete structures with new ways of building buildings such as the Gulf Life Building. When this was under construction in the early 1960s, people were just had their breath taken away that a building could look like this and be made like this so that it is on cantilevered concrete. And the resulting building, the Gulf Life Building, now called River Place Tower, is on the National Register of Historic Places uh, for concrete structures and is recognized as one of the mo 10 most significant precast, post-tension concrete buildings in the world, right here in Jacksonville. And this building with its soaring, uh, almost uh, musical sort of rhythmic uh, towering structure is one of Jacksonville's modern icons from this movement, from this era. There's the Hayden Burns Library with its fins. Mm. And here you see Jeb Stewart High School with its folded plate concrete roof with the, the shape of the concrete gave it strength by having two plates of concrete that fused together with many varieties of shapes. This whole modern movement took on such varieties as you see in the old Skinner's Jerry store that many of your viewers may remember that we still have 19 of these uh, almost eagle-like buildings with wings flapping out so the cars <laughs> would pull up and get right. their bottles of milk. We have other modern buildings downtown and this is part of this mid-century modern movement. The Universal Marion Building is now the headquarters for the JEA and you have churches with this strange and amazing modern structure and realize most of these were built way over 50 years ago. They seem very ultra modern even in our current time. This is St. Paul's Episcopal Church by the St. Paul's by the Sea Episcopal Church at the beach by a wonderful uh, Georgia architect named Blake Ellis. And one of the chief exponents uh, uh, or disciples of this mid-century architecture was Robert Broward. Bob uh, came back to Jacksonville in the 1950s and started designing buildings that were way ahead of their time and still are ultra-modern even as we look at them today. Uh, Bob Broward uh, uh, stayed with Frank Lloyd Wright and was one of his disciples, brought his ideas back to Jacksonville and built these buildings of breathtaking beauty, of streamlined uh, 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 visual concepts, and using new modern materials in ways like, here's the old Regency Theater, it sadly is now torn down, mm. but it was uh, quite a great example of this style of architecture. 
perhaps Brower's most uh, well-known work is the Unitarian Church on the Arlington Expressway yeah, uh, that beautiful. is just uh, one of Jacksonville's great iconic landmarks. There you see it, the mm -hmm. same building, the other side. He built many residences and office buildings and uh, beachfront homes. This one's out at Ponte Vedra. It's definitely <laughs> one of the most amazing houses in, in all of Northeast Florida. And you can see the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. People can see the Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah. He also, with Taylor Hardwick, designed the old Jacksonville Art Museum at Kroger Center. Mm -hmm. No longer the Art Museum anymore, but the building is still there. Taylor Hardwick was one of his colleagues back there in the 50s and 60s. And Taylor went on to not only design the Hayden Burns Library, but also many other buildings with this fascinating uh, sense of modernity, of uh, being part of the new space age, the Jetsons, mm -hmm. uh, if you will. The idea, here, here's the Hayden Burns Library, the idea that buildings can not only be icons of their time, but can be works of art. Hey, uh, the Friendship Fountain area was also designed by Taylor Hardwick, and one of the great buildings of the Friendship Fountain, which was recently uh, restored, the fountain was, mm -hmm. but this building, the old Harbor Masters building, part of that uh, campus, if you will, has been torn down, and that's now where the uh, uh, River City Brewery is today. But I, I love this little building. I wish it were still there. Mm -hmm. uh, Hardwick also designed the Fletcher Building on Riverside Avenue. And you see overlapping traits in these buildings and that each one is a separate work of art with a separate idea. Here is a school designed by Hardwick, uh, Jeff, Jeb Stewart High School, and uh, one of his houses out in the Clifton area, the Marion King residence, that's uh, awash with all different colors and shapes and the original color scheme that it originally had. Another of their colleagues from this time was William Morgan. William Morgan was a Harvard-trained architect and uh, truly is still known throughout the world. Uh, all of these gentlemen are still with us, mm -hmm. and uh, although uh, Broward and Morgan are no longer practicing architecture, uh, their buildings still remain. Morgan's own residence, built in the mid-1960s, uh, was highlighted in Playboy magazine and would became famous throughout the world. This beachfront home was radical of its time, and still, as you stand there and look at this house at Atlantic Beach today, you just uh, wonder how someone could have thought of these concepts. Yeah. Another Morgan beachfront house that's now been torn down, the Goodlow residence, and uh, a house over off of uh, Empire Point, another house off of, the Arl uh, off of University Boulevard. These are all houses by William Morgan, and here is the state office building, which he built downtown, mm -hmm. later converted to a parking garage for the Hyatt Hotel. He also designed the Police Memorial Building, which is a wonderful pyramid-like structure with terraces and actually an urban park on the very top of this building. Mm -hmm. So Morgan uh, and Broward and Hardwick brought the modern concepts of architecture to Jacksonville, but there were other architects, such as the architect for the Chart House, whose name was Kendrick Bang Kellogg, who is known throughout the world for his free-form sculptural buildings, of which we have one of his very best designs here in our city. Uh, another uh, wonderful building at the beach, known throughout the world, is by architect Paul Rudolph. The Milam House has been written up in architectural journals throughout the world. And you can see why. Even today, that building is quite radical. One of the buildings that did not make it, but was also designed by a world-famous architect, was the um, Butterfly House over off of San Jose Boulevard, designed by Bruce Goff, another Frank Lloyd Wright disciple. Mm -hmm. That building was torn down for a McMansion. And here you see the Ernest House at Clifton. All these were built in the 50s and 60s. And the Fleming House, designed by local architect William Marshall. And Ted Pappas, who's still practicing architecture, designed the Senior Citizens Center over in Springfield. Mary Singleton. Uh, 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 Mary Singleton, that's right, right. A, a wonderful example of this uh, later part of the style. Mm -hmm. He also designed the Greek Orthodox Church on Atlantic Boulevard. So here we're faced with the idea, ranch-style houses in Arlington, <laughs> eligible for the National Register. Who would have thought it? But the whole idea is to get people involved in realizing that architecture is part of their history 
It's part of their time. And even though you look across your street and see your neighbor's house and you say, well, that's just my neighbor's house, there actually may be history lurking in that so that as Jacksonville skyline becomes ever more modern and takes on new eras, buildings that are built today, a hundred years from now will someday be historic. So we need to be aware of the layers of history and layers of time, not just buildings that were built after the Great Fire of 1901, but buildings of the 50s and 60s. Right. And these modern buildings that are being created today uh, will be sometime, someday icons of the future. But it takes some adjusting, doesn't it, to uh, all of a sudden realize that because the criteria that we're, that we're looking at is just 50 years, then it's eligible. The right. National Register of Historic Places says that any building that's 50 years old can be eligible, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean just any old building. No. It must be a building that expresses art and architecture and design qualities and history that uh, make it significant beyond just the age of the building. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that the Hayden Burns Library was built on the site of the old city hall. That was designed by Clutho, which was a beautiful domed classical building that if it were still in downtown Jacksonville would be one of our most prized landmarks. We would wish that uh, we still had both. But it got, but it got torn down in yeah. order to build the next building, so we have layer upon mm -hmm. layer of history, yeah. and we just sometimes have to decide which one is the significant one to save. Because I guess that was one of Clutho's best buildings. It was one of his, his best classical yeah. buildings. Yeah. He went on to design buildings in the prairie style of architecture, influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright, mm -hmm. of which Jacksonville has the greatest collection of prairie style buildings of any city outside the Midwest. We also are starting to look at not just single buildings to try to preserve them, but also to preserve the context in which they are, the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And as we see a collection of buildings like these mid-century modern buildings, they're spread throughout Jacksonville. They're not just in one single place, although probably the greatest conglomeration of them are in downtown and in Arlington. And we hope over the next few years to have what's called a thematic group nomination for the National Register which would embrace all these far-flung buildings in one National Register thematic district, which would include all those buildings and give them national recognition that they deserve. And, and as you say, it does require a little bit of adjustment uh, uh, on the part of historic preservationists to suddenly uh, realize that these buildings are now historic and, uh, and need to be protected. As we grow older, the buildings that were there when we were young uh, uh, start maybe start to seem a little more important. Mm -hmm. When we first started Riverside Avondale Preservation, a common comment was, this was back in the 1970s, why those buildings aren't historic? These are the buildings that I grew up in when I was a kid. There's right. nothing historic about them. And we said, wait a minute, you have to understand that, first of all, you're getting older, and these buildings are getting older, and they're not just old buildings, but they're important works of art. They're buildings that have a context and a part of our history that needs to be preserved so that future generations can look back and see the history of our city uh, over the years through its architecture. And uh, people, we organize tours and so forth of uh, historic buildings. Now we're going to have to uh, reconfigure some of those tours and, and say these also are important buildings. Well, actually, Harry, that's happened. Uh, there have been three annual tours of modern buildings, a group called Docomomo, which is a national or international organization that's out to preserve historic uh, mid-century modern buildings has had three tours in Jacksonville and they'll have another one coming up in the spring so be on the lookout for that for a tour of Jacksonville's mid-century modern architectural heritage. Uh, Dr. Wayne Wood we're out of time thank you very much enjoyed the show very much uh, if you want more information about Jacksonville's history visit the Historical Society website www.jackshistory or call 665-0064 and for now, as Emily Liska always says, we're history. <laughs>